Hello everybody and welcome to Limited Level Ups. Today we've got our first little bit of Thunder Junction content coming your way. Full set, not quite out yet at the time of recording this, but we're almost there. We're like 80% of the way there. And I thought it just might be fun to give some initial impressions I've had in the set, talking about some mechanics, talking about some cards that have caught my eye so far. I was almost going to make this just like a short 10 to 15 minute long YouTube video, but... I think there's enough stuff to talk about here for a full-on podcast episode. I'm very excited to talk about what's going on in this set. I mean, I'm always very excited to talk about new sets, but excited to share might be a little more accurate. I've never actually done a piece of content like this, sort of just like musing on some ideas before doing the full Limited Level Ups full set review, which, by the way, coming next week, we're going to be recording that on Twitch April 8th and 9th, and of course, going to be posted to the podcast feed and the YouTube channel shortly after that. But... Like I said, excited to talk some magic. The set's also pretty complex, a lot of words, so I figured the extra onboarding content wouldn't hurt. So if this is your kind of episode, please let me know, and let's get into it. Okay, so the first thing I have to call attention to when talking about Thunder Junction is if you're not quite feeling the hype of the set just yet, maybe it's not quite gripping you, maybe the flavor doesn't quite speak to you, one thing you can get hyped about as a limited player is it's a Dave set, the GOAT, the GOAT set designer. Dave Humphreys was the lead designer for this set. If you're not familiar with Dave's work, he's responsible for a lot of fan favorites, stuff like Call Time, March of the Machine, Kamigawa Neon Dynasty, Aquaria, a lot of bangers. He also played a part in uh, Avacyn Restored, but we don't talk about Avacyn Restored. But yeah, Dave knows how to design a good limited set for sure. One of the features of a Dave set that I I've noticed is a recurring theme is he really likes to work dual lands at common into his set file. Thunder Junction is indeed one of those sets. We do have dual lands at common i really like dual lands at common this also just looks like a set where three color stuff is certainly supported which has kind of been uh, a fixture of, of modern limited in the past year or two it's been rare that a multicolor deck in some form or fashion is not available and certainly that kind of strategy does get propped up by having 10 of those dual lands at common so excited for that all right let's talk some mechanics so the first one i want to talk about is plot i think plot is the most complex the most interesting most novel unique mechanic in the set it seems to me at least the mechanic that's the most like what exactly is this doing and why do i want to do it <laughs> when you first read it uh so certain cards will have a plot cost in addition to a normal mana cost as well you can find this on any card type creatures instant sorceries and plot says you can pay this card's plot cost and exile it from your hand only as a sorcery by the way and then you can cast it on a future turn at sorcery speed without paying its mana cost. So you're sort of pre-paying for the spell. An example I have here is a Rascable Wolverine. This is two in a red for a 3-2 at common. When it enters the battlefield, you exile the top card of your library until the end of turn. You can play that card, has a plot cost of two and a red. So the same as its mana cost, sometimes the plot cost is going to be different from its mana cost. So this mechanic is sort of like foretell from call time, although with plot, you exile the card face up, notably. Your opponent can see all the, the cogs turning in your oh so devious plot. And without seeing a bunch of cards with plot on them, it, it kind of makes you go... Okay, well, at least it made me go, okay, but, like, why am I doing this? What benefit does plotting a card actually give me? And the answer to that is a lot of different things. I think they're pretty creative with this mechanic because it's implemented in a lot of different ways, and a lot of cards that have plot play pretty differently from each other. So I'm just going to rattle off a few ways they've chosen to implement this mechanic. The first one being, if we're going to look at our Wolverine example we just looked at, cards that are better with untapped mana. This is one kind of plot card you're going to find where a card is stronger or gives you more options at least when you have all of your mana untapped. These red impulse draw effects like the Wolverine has where you can only cast the card until the end of this turn. Some of them have the end of your next turn. They tend to have the drawback of if you hit a really expensive spell, you just can't cast it sometimes. And plot helps you out with that a bit. If you plot the Wolverine on turn three and then you cast it for free on turn four, it's more likely it's actually going to flip over a card you can actually cast. Also, another thing I think is pretty cool is that plot in general treads upon a fundamental question that you're often posed with in Limited, which is evaluating, is this game about tempo or is it about value? Do I need to affect the board right now? Or can I play with my life till a little bit, draw an extra card or two? Because with the Wolverine, you're going to play it on turn three sometimes. You're on the draw, your opponent's gone, two drop, three drop. You maybe even missed your two drop this is the first thing you got to play. Yeah, you're going to play it. You're going to miss out on a little bit of value, but you're going to play it instead of plotting it because you probably need to block at that point. Okay, next thing that plot's doing, and this one's pretty straightforward, is sometimes the plot cost is cheaper than the card's mana value. So we got a common here, Gin of Fool's Fall. It's four and a blue for a four, three flyer. But its plot cost is 3 and blue, only 4 mana. So if you can 
take the time off if you aren't getting pressured, if you've got an early board state where you can afford to spend four mana to quote unquote do nothing, then the next turn you get to cast the Jin for free and you've essentially saved a mana, right? You've almost gained a mana in some ways if you want to look at it like that. And I think in general, another way you can look at plot cards is it's a mechanic that helps you not waste your mana, sort of like Foretell did, where you have these awkward turns where you're like, ah, man, like I, I don't want to cast this card or I can't cast this card, for example, in the case of the Jin here, if you just don't have anything to do with four mana, all your hand is five drops. Hopefully, you know, you've not built your deck in that way, but it's just to say hypothetically here, the rest of your hand is expensive stuff. Well, it feels really, really bad to do absolutely nothing on turn four. So instead, you can plot, and then on turn five, cast one of your five drops, plus be able to cast a gin for free. Which is just another thing I like about plot. You know, if you've listened to any of my content at all, but especially recently, I've been talking about this a lot, just how important it is in the early turns of the game, like one to four or five, spending all your mana every single turn. And when you don't, when you waste a mana, two mana, three mana, it's really catastrophic in ways that are, are kind of non-obvious. Plot kind of helps you lean into what the game engine asks of you uh, if you want to win, <laughs> which is spending all your mana in the early turns. And it just makes for, I think, just less feel bad turns where you're just like, well, I just absolutely can't do anything here. And along the lines of helping you spend mana on turns that might be a little bit awkward, maybe on a turn that's a little bit difficult to double spell, there's a lot of plot cards that are sort of situational or a card that you might want to cast later in the game. And plot lets you put them on layaway for the time that they're going to be a little more relevant. So two examples I have here, Black Snag Buzzard. This is two and a black for a 2-1 flyer at common. It enters the battlefield with a plus one plus one counter on it if a creature died this turn and its plot cost is one and a black. So you don't have a creature that's died this turn, but you also don't want to waste your mana. Well, you plot it and then you can cast a little bit later. Another example here, Sheriff of Safe Passage, two and a white for a zero zero. This one's an uncommon. Enters the battlefield with a plus one plus one counter on it plus an additional plus one plus one counter for each other creature you control. Its plot cost is one in a white as well, just like the buzzard. So you can kind of see a pattern emerging here where it's like, okay, both these cards are not just great on curve. Sometimes you're going to cast them on curve, but I think a lot of the time you're just going to, let's say on turn four, double spell with a two drop and plotting one of these cards. And then on a later turn, when it's a little more relevant, when you can get full value off of it, you're going to cast it later. Which again, treads upon the idea of, do you want the onboard presence now or a little bit more value later or a card that will promise more onboard presence later? All right, another flavor of plot cards we have are cards that give you an effect when you plot them. So something like Longhorn Sharpshooter, it's two and a red for a three, three reach at uncommon. Plot cost is three and a red, so a little more expensive, but when it becomes plotted, you deal two damage to any target. So once again, it's that same question of value now or board presence now. Can you afford to wait till turn four to kill something and then play this later? If you can, that's great. Sometimes though, you're going to have to make that choice. And I know I keep bringing this up, but it's because I think this is going to be a very skill testing part of the format where good players, one of the things they, they know how to do, they know how to analyze the game state and go, okay, this game is going to be about this. It's going to be about that. They know when they have to just play their three mana, three, three on curve. They know when they can afford to plot their longhorn first. So just something to, to keep your eye on something that if you think you're somebody who has a little bit of trouble, some struggles figuring out which one of these two things should I do? Should I play for the long game or should I just play on curve here? Plot's really going to make you think about that. Okay, and the last thing I want to talk about with Plot, which I think is actually the most exciting and the coolest and the most aspirational, is there's some cards in the set that care about the number of spells you've cast in a turn. I, I think they were really going for like the, the one big turn feeling. You know, if you've played with Storm cards before in Vintage Cube or otherwise, Storm is all about like, okay, cast a bunch of cheap spells and then I have my one big Storm card that copies for each time I've cast a spell before this turn. And I think they're kind of going for that vibe or that play pattern or that gameplay loop. So the example I'm going to put forth here is a pretty powerful card, one of the better uncommons. Outlaw Stitcher. This is four mana for a 1-4 in blue, so three in a blue for a 1-4. It says, when Outlaw Stitcher enters the battlefield, create a 2-2 two -two blue and black rogue creature token. Then put two plus one plus one counters on that token for each spell you've cast this turn other than the first. And this one also has plot for four and a blue. So you can just imagine if you're just like, plot, 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 maybe you've got a few things on layaway, and then you cast this as your third or fourth spell per turn. That's a lot of power and toughness for four mana. And otherwise, plot's like a little bit of like a dry mechanic where it's like, okay, it's very mechanical. It lets you spend your mana, maybe helps you plan ahead a little bit more. But I think this is going to really be a fun way to implement plot for those people that, that are really looking to uh, get their kicks from, okay, what's the biggest thing I can do? It's the biggest number 
number I can get this to. It's the most triggers I can put on the stack. You know, it's, it's very exciting for our brains sometimes to do that. And I think that cards like Outlaw Stitcher really play into that. There's also some variants of this. So there's a card like Gem Lightfoot, Sky Explorer, which is two blue-white for a 3-3 Flying Vigilance at Uncommon. And it says at the beginning of your end step, if you haven't cast a spell from your hand this turn, draw a card. So this one wants you to play a little bit differently. It's not building up to one big turn. It's just saying, all right, I want you to keep plotting, keep spending mana on your turn, but not actually casting a spell on your turn so you can keep drawing cards off gem. This also pushes you towards casting cards on your opponent's turn, cards with flash, instants and sorcery. So a lot of stuff you can do with this card. And by the way, that's actually Blue White's theme in this set. It wants you to not cast cards from your hand in order to get some benefits from your payoff cards. And then Blue Red's theme is a little bit of a variant on that. So we have something like Slick Sequence, which is red blue for an instant at uncommon slick sequence deals two damage to any target but if you've cast another spell this turn draw a card and a lot of blue red stuff triggers off of the second spell you've cast each turn and also slick sequence just a really cool card i i just read this card and i smile it kind of reminds me a little bit of electrolyze which is uh one of my favorite cards of all time so yeah i, th I think it's gonna be a pretty fun one to play and if you're just looking through all the archetypes by the way a lot of them do key off the fact that plot is a main set mechanic. So if you're like, I don't get why is this caring about this? You know, if you looked at blue white and you're like, oh, I'm not casting spells in my turn. That's that's a little bit strange. If you're ever a little bit confused, just think, okay, how does plot work into how this archetype might play? All right, and let's move on to our next mechanic, which is committing a crime. I think this is the second most prevalent mechanic in the set, the one that's spread across a bunch of different colors and a bunch of cards will care about when you commit a crime. And to commit a crime means to target an opponent, target anything they control, or target something in their graveyard. So it's basically just any game action that interacts with the opponent in any way. You know, commander players rejoice because targeting your opponent's stuff is now officially a crime as far as magic rules go. And so because it has such a wide range of how to commit a crime, it's something that's going to happen pretty easily game to game, turn to turn. Like, I don't really think you have to build your deck around oh i need more stuff that targets and in fact a lot of cards in this set have more built-in things that just help you commit a crime so there's stuff that will exile things from your opponent's graveyard there's like a, a two mana two two lifelink in black that when it comes in it mills target player for two cards so that's just like two mana two two lifelink commit a crime and so because of that a lot of the payoffs in fact i think almost all of the payoffs in the set are gated to happening only once per turn. So we have a card here, Raven of Fell Omens. This is one in a black for a one, two flyer at common. When you commit a crime, each opponent loses a life and you gain a life. This only triggers once per turn though. That's gonna be a line of text you see almost always on these committing a crime payoffs. Which to me just kind of confirms the vibe I have about committing a crime, which is it's kind of just trivial. It's not something you have to build your deck around. It's going to be something you have to sequence properly. I think that's kind of the fun of it all. Just like, okay, when do I cast her in my removal spell? When do I want this thing to trigger? Like, it's more of an in-game puzzle to solve rather than a deck building puzzle to solve. Like, even the dual lands in this set, they come in and they deal a damage to target opponent. So even your land drops can help you commit a crime. So one thing that's kind of interesting is if they're all gated to once per turn, instants go up a little bit in value because if you have a bunch of instants you can trigger stuff on your turn for example the raven we just looked at well you can trigger something on your turn commit a crime on your turn pass the turn cast an instant speed removal spell or you have an instant speed way to target something in their graveyard and that also triggers again so you kind of get a little more value than you might expect by just looking at the once per turn because you can do twice per turn cycle if you've got instant ways to commit crimes there's a pretty cool card i want to call out here intimidation campaigns this is one blue black for an enchantment at uncommon it says when intimidation campaign enters the battlefield each opponent loses a life and you gain a life and you draw a card, and then whenever you commit a crime, you can return Intimidation Campaign to its owner's hand, which actually, this one isn't once per turn, although it is kind of gated by you having to pay more mana to keep playing it, but it's a really cool callback to Disinformation Campaign, which was one of the best uncommons in that set. Really, really brutal to play against. This one doesn't make you discard, thankfully, but I still think this is going to be a really cool card, a really fun card to play. Okay, so plot and committing a crime, those are the two big mechanics of the set. Now we've got a few smaller things that are kind of spread throughout the set. First one here is saddle, which you'll find on mount creatures, which is basically just things that you can ride, including weird snake horses, apparently. So an example of this is trained Erenix. This is a cat beast mount. This is one and a white for a 3-1 at common. When it attacks while saddled, 
it gains first strike until end of turn, scry one, and has saddle two, which says tap any number of other creatures you control with power two or more. This mount becomes saddled until end of turn, saddle only as a sorcery. So it's kind of like crewing a vehicle except the vehicle is a creature. And instead of turning the vehicle into a creature, you're turning your creature into a better version of the creature. You'll get an effect, maybe you'll get uh, a combat bonus or something like that. This is green white's mechanic and the signpost in common, or at least one of them, because there's actually two signposts for each color pair here is Miriam Herd Whisperer, really strong card. This is green white for a three two, it's a legendary creature. As long as it's your turn, mounts and vehicles you control have hexproof, and whenever a mount or vehicle you control attacks, put a plus one plus one counter on it. And just like vehicles, the kind of mechanical reason you're gonna want to do this is, well, once the board's kind of stalled out a little bit, you don't have great attacks with the aggro deck, you can then saddle your creature, it'll get a bonus, or first strike in the case of the card we just looked at. Miriam here can start pumping things up. So just, just something that you'll see here and there throughout the set, kind of a cool one. Next up, we've got Spree, which is sort of the kicker mechanic of this set, the mechanic that helps you spend more mana as the game goes on. Very similar to Escalate, actually, if you've played with Escalate before. Spree is only on instance or sorceries and it'll give you a bunch of different modes and all these modes have additional mana cost these spree cards sometimes have two additional modes sometimes have three and the way they're templated is they'll always have a small mana cost that you always have to pay that's the way you see in the the top right corner here the rest of the card have a bunch of other modes that tell you the cost you have to pay if you want to tack on these modes to the card and you can do any number of them it says spree says choose one or more additional modes so for example here we've got shifting grift Blue, blue, you always have to pay that, but the three modes you can tack on, two mana, exchange control of two target creatures, one mana, exchange control of two target artifacts, and one mana, exchange control of two target enchantments. So this scales as much as you want. You can just do four mana, exchange control of two target creatures. You can do three mana, exchange control of two target artifacts. You could do five mana, exchange control of two target creatures and two target artifacts. So yeah, not all that much that's complex about these cards. It's just, if you've played with Kicker before, it's just a little bit of a variant on Kicker. We've got cards that care about outlaws, which is a batching mechanic, which kind of just shoves a bunch of like creature types or card types together to say, hey, this card cares about all these things. Example here is a Vile Smasher Gleeful Grenadier. It's actually very hard to say. Say that one five times fast. So this is black red for a 3-2 at an uncommon. It says whenever another outlaw enters the battlefield under your control, Vile Smasher deals one damage to target opponent. And outlaws are assassins, mercenaries, pirates, rogues, and warlocks. And of course, the set's going to have a bunch of those. And mercenaries brings us to our last thing we're going to talk about today, which are mercenary tokens. And this isn't a full mechanic or anything, but just something you're going to see on a good handful of cards. This is kind of the, the unique token type of this set so example here i've got rakish crew which is a two and a black enchantment and uncommon it says when rakish crew enters the battlefield you create a one one red mercenary creature token with tap target creature you control gets plus one plus oh until on a turn activate only as a sorcery and this also says whenever an outlaw you control dies each opponent loses a life you gain a life. So sort of a variant on a Blood Artist sort of effect. And I like these tokens quite a bit. The, basically, what, what you're getting out of these is it helps your creatures attack as the game goes on. Make sure that you can break through board stalls. But it's also not super obnoxious as the defender. Because unlike some mechanics that help you attack, this only pumps power, right? It's not going to pump toughness. So you're not just going to be like, well, I can't block that. I can't block that. I can't block that. You're going to be able to block whatever they pump. It's just going to be a trade down sometimes. They're going to be able to trade their 2-2 for your 4-mana creature. All right, that's going to do it for talking about mechanics. Now I just want to talk about some individual cards that stood out to me. Some groups of cards that I thought were interesting Starting with a trend that I, I noticed on some creatures in the set, and I hope they continue, and that's large creatures, expensive creatures, four plus mana, that don't have an enter the battlefield effect, but do have a ward ability tacked on them, a little bit of protection. I see this as them trying to correct an issue that has definitely arisen in the past few years, where any four plus mana creature that doesn't have an enter the battlefield effect just ends up being a lot worse than you might think. Because the issue is now that they've printed a lot more good two and three mana removal, if you play a four drop that doesn't do anything when it comes in and your opponent spends two or three mana to deal with it, well, your opponent's got a mana advantage over you. You're actually losing something when that happens to you, when your four drop that didn't do anything when it comes in 
gets hit by a two or three mana removal spell. You know, I could go through the sets in the last year or so and pull an example from each set, but if you just want to go back to MKM, two cards that really stick out to me. Tin Street Gossip, which is the two red-green 4-4 four, four at Uncommon in Murders that taps to add two mana for Disguise Creatures or to flip up a Disguise Creature, and Cranko's Buzz Crusher, the rare 4-4 four, four flying trample thing that has a line of constructed text, but these were not great cards in Murders, pretty big underperformers, and if you look at the stats for these cards, they did not perform very well on 17 land and one of the most common things i'd see on twitter or reddit or just you know wherever people are talking about magic is people going like whoa what's going on with Krenko's buzz crusher like that card looks pretty good it's a four mana four four flying trampler isn't that just good well yes it does have good stats but I really want to stress how bad it is when you get your Krenko's Buzz Crusher gotten by a cheap removal spell or, you know, of course, it was also an artifact so sometimes you got blown up by the orangutan. That's a whole, it's a whole other story. But just in general, the, the question of why isn't this card as good as I think it is, is, is just that. I believe it just comes down to that. It's a four mana creature that doesn't have an enter the battlefield effect. And they definitely tried to solve that in this set in Thunder Junction by tacking on war to some more expensive creatures. So for example here, Marauding Sphinx. 3 blue blue for a 3-5 flying vigilance ward 2 creature at uncommon. It says whenever you commit a crime, surveil 2. This triggers only once per turn, like most of the committing a crime abilities. And this is just a perfect example where I would not be into this card very much if it didn't have that ward 2. But since your opponent will likely have to trade even on mana to kill the Sphinx, I'm much more into it. Spinewood Armadillo, another good example here. This is a 4 green green 7-7 seven, seven reach creature with ward 3. It's also got an ability where you can discard it for 2 mana and go get a basic land or a desert, put it into your hand and gain 3 life. And a direct comparison, actually, kind of funny, to Tin Street Gossip. We've got the Gruel Uncommon here, the Gruel Signpost, Cactus Folk, Sure Shot. Very similar looking card. Two red green for a 4 4 reach, but it's got Ward 2. And that's a really, really big deal. Also, has the ability to begin at combat on your turn. Other creatures you control with power 4 greater gain trample and haste until end of turn. So, this is something that I, I think is a big deal. It's not on all the expensive creatures, they can't just like throw around Ward all over, but. I do think it is a big deal when you're evaluating these cards. Just note that, hey, that Ward 2, that Ward 3, don't overlook that. I think it's kind of easy to be like, okay, what is what are the words in the card do? Like, what are the, the cool abilities? But don't overlook the Ward. That, that is a really important part of all these cards. Speaking of protection, we've got two good protection spells at common. Snakeskin Veil, single green mana for an instant. Put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature. It gains Hexproof until end of turn. And Take Up Shield, one and a white for an instant. Put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature. It gains Lifelink and Indestructible until end of turn. We last saw this one in Dominaria United. It was fantastic there, one of the top commons. So it might be a tough set for removal. If there's a bunch of good protection spells running around, if all these expensive things have ward, removal might just have a little bit of a tougher go at it in this set. I guess the one mechanical thing that is present throughout the set that I didn't really talk about is deserts. I mentioned it a second ago, but there are a bunch of lands in this set that have the subtype desert. There's going to be some cards that care about desert. It's not like a gigantic theme or anything. It's not even close to like the cave deck in LCI where there's like a desert deck. There just happens to be some cards that care about deserts. And one desert that I wanted to call out here is an uncommon one, Arid Archway. It enters the battlefield tapped, and when it enters the battlefield, you return a land you control to its owner's hand. If another desert was returned this way, you surveil one, and here's the kicker. It adds colorless, colorless. So if you haven't encountered these Carews, bounce lands before, whatever you want to call them. They're very powerful because they look kind of weird. It's like, okay, yeah, you play a land and you have to pick up a land. So you're like neutral on mana. It's not like you're ramping, but these are card advantage, right? If you have an opening hand with Arid Archway and only one other land, that's a great hand because that's a three mana source hand. You're essentially drawing an additional land when you play these kind of lands. Now, when we've seen these in the past, they've been colored land. They've been in Ravnica sets where they actually added two colors instead of two colorless, or the OG ones, the Karoos added a colorless and one color. So we've got a question of, does the card advantage that this card provides you outweigh the fact that it is a colorless land, which is a pretty big cost? We'll see. Next up, we've got the Preening Champion or the Chimney Rabble or the Dunling Crabane or the Inside Source. I feel like we have one of these every single set at this point. The creature that comes with a friend that is well costed. Great name too. This is Prickly Pear. This is two and a red for a 2-2 two -two Plant Mercenary. <laughs> and it comes with a 1-1 one -one red Mercenary Creature Token. That's the one that you can tap to give something plus one plus zero. Oh. So yeah, I think this card's going to be good. Kind of a little bit of a riff on Inside Source specifically, where instead of having to pay the additional mana to give plus two in Vigilance, you don't have to pay mana, but you don't get as big of a boost. I, I can't imagine this is going to be anything less than one of the top commons, basically. It's just going to be a good card. So there's a random cool card that I wanted to point point out is phantom interference this is one of the spree cards this one's a common single blue mana for an instant 
And the two modes you can tack on are three mana to create a 2-2 white spirit token with flying, and one mana counter target spell unless its controller pays two. So it's kind of got three modes here, right? It's got one in a blue for like the quench or reasonable doubt sort of counter spell unless they pay two. Four mana to make a 2-2 flyer at instant speed, which is not great. Then five mana to do it all. And if you can nab a spell, like you hold a mana on turn five, you get to nab your opponent's four or five drop and make a 2-2 flyer. That is great. Now, it's not always going to happen like that, but the ability for your cheap counter spell that's good in the early game to still be good later and have the ceiling of being excellent later, just being like fantastic. I really like this. One to keep your eye on for sure. An old favorite with some new skin here, Bristleback Sentry. This is one in a green for a 3-3 defender. And it says, as long as you control a creature with power four or greater, Bristleback Sentry can attack as though it didn't have defender. So this card is a functional reprint of Drowsing Tyranodon. And Drowsing Tyranodon is a card that is often imitated, never duplicated, except now. This is the actual first time we've had a true functional reprint of Drowsing Tyranodon. And the reason I'm making such a big deal about this card, where it's different from some of the cards we've seen in the past that have not been so good, Territorial Witch Stalker kind of comes to mind, is you can just put a plus one, plus one counter on this card and it can attack by itself. It doesn't say another creature, power four or greater. You can pump it with a mercenary token. You can cast a pump spell pre-combat, although it's not going to be something you do very often. This is quite a strong card when we first saw it for that reason that it can kind of enable itself. So another one to keep your eye on, especially if you are used to this kind of card not being very good. I do suspect this one will be quite a bit better than the cards we've seen recently that sort of look like it. And just one more thing to call out here. I always like when they do this and they've done it in a few spots where they take a card that they've tried a few times and it just has never been good, even with certain set contexts. And they just give it a bit of a bump. So we've got Vengeful Townsfolk here. This is two and a white for a 3-3. Three, three. And it says whenever one or more creatures you control die, put a plus one plus one counter on Vengeful Townsfolk. So usually this kind of card is like a two mana 1-1 one, one, or a three mana 2-2. Two, two. Just starts a little bit small, but we're starting as a three mana 3-3, three, three, which really solves the big issue that these cards have, where they're just too small on curve and you can't block with them and you hope to untap with them. So you can hope to start growing them. It's just a lot of hoops to jump through. I like that Vengeful Town Folk at least starts at a solid baseline. It scales from there. And like I said, there's a few other cards that I've noticed that kind of follow this trend of like, okay, here's something that it hasn't really worked before. Hasn't been a card type, a card template that has really been a successful one. Let's tweak it a little bit. Let's buff it a little bit. Buffs in the right places. I, I guess that's what I'm kind of getting at here. I really like when they buff things in the right places. Now, the last thing I want to talk about today is what the heck is going on with all the bonus sheets, with the multiple special guests and list and this apparent like second set that they shove into this set. Let me break it down because it is actually quite confusing. It's something that I was like, hold on, what's, what's going on here? It took me a little bit of reading to wrap my head around it. But when it comes down to it, it's actually not that different than what we saw in MKM. So the first symbol is just the cowboy hat. This is just the Thunder Junction OTJ expansion symbol that's on all the cards in the main set. The set symbol that looks like a jail. It's got like a little keyhole and some bars. This is what's called the Breaking News bonus sheet. And this is a traditional bonus sheet, just like the Strixhaven Mystical Archives, the Wilds of Eldraine Enchantment sheet, the March of the Machine Legend sheet. You're going to see one of these cards in every single pack. So it is guaranteed in every pack. There's a specific slot, just like all the other bonus sheets. And the theme this time is cards that commit crimes. And I think this is actually going to be the most limited relevant bonus sheet we've had because things that commit crimes generally are removal spells. So you got stuff like Path to Exile, and they've reprinted Leyline Binding. We've got Ride Down, which is a classic. Thoughtseize is on this bonus list, and of course, that that is something that commits a crime. So all these cards, like, there's going to be very few of them that are blanks. And the kind of tippity-top cream of the crop here, the really exciting ones to open, is that Oko Thief of Crowns, like OG Oko, is actually on this bonus sheet, which might be a pro to some, might be a con. I know some people don't like these, like, ultra-powerful cards that you're going to open once every 200 drafts running around, it kind of is like, well, it feels bad when my opponent has it and I never got a chance to have it because it's so rare. I think that adds some fun to, to a limited format. I, I'm more of the opinion that like, well, it's really cool when you open it. If my opponent opens it, I'm happy for them too. Also beating an Oko is kind of fun. You know, you're not always in a spot to be able to do that, but when you do, it's a really good story. Also fractured identity. This is one that maybe not everybody knows. This is three white blue for a sorcery. You exile target non-land permanent. Each other player then creates a copy of whatever you exiled. So essentially, you kill something, you get an exact copy of it, 
with the end of the battlefield effect is basically just like a really souped up mind control variant. We've also got mana drain, which is a blue blue counter target spell and you add colorless mana equal to that spell's mana cost at the beginning of your next main phase. So some really powerful stuff running around here as well as just some solid removal spells. So this is going to be a really impactful bonus sheet, which is not something I could say about the uh, the wilds of all drain enchantment bonus sheet, for example. Okay, so we've got the main set, which is the little cowboy hat. We've got the bonus sheet, the breaking news committing a crime bonus sheet, which is the little jail symbol. Here's where it gets a little bit confusing. In Murders of Karlov Manor, we had a slot in the pack that was 80% of the time, just a common, just a random common from, from the set, and 20% of the time was either a card from the list or a special guest, which is basically a list card, but just with new art. Something like Tireless Tracker, Drown in the Lock, Victimize, Field of the Dead, these are some other ones. In this set, that slot is slightly different. So you're still gonna get the special guest cards, the thematic cards with new art. We've got some examples here, Mystic Snake, Brazen Borrower, Stoneforge Mystic. But instead of cards from the list, the Putrid Warrior, Crows and Tusker, War of the Spark, Jace kind of cards we saw, we instead have an entire other set shoved into this slot that was a cancelled set. So what Wizards did in their infinite wisdom and foresight is when they came up with the idea for the March of the Machine Aftermath set, which is kind of that, that epilogue set that nobody really liked very much, did not do very well in stores, it was one of their, their big, biggest product failures in years according to WotC. Well, they thought it was going to be a very successful product and they made an epilogue set for this set. And then they saw, oh hey, that set didn't sell. We saw all these new cards we designed. What are we going to do? The way they solve that is they're shoving all those cards into this slot, which again is only going to be a special card 20% of the time. 80% of the time is just going to be a common. But from what we've seen so far, and at the time of recording, I haven't seen all of them just yet. They haven't been revealed. These cards seem pretty powerful. They've really only shown the mythics, so this is definitely skewing uh, my perception of the power, I'm sure. We haven't seen the rares and the uncommons that they plan to print, but here's an example of a mythic. We got a new sword, Sword of Wealth and Power, three mana for mythic equipment. Crypt creature gets plus two, plus two, and gains protection from instants and sorceries. And when it deals combat damage to a player, create a treasure token, and the next spell you cast, and the next instant or sorcery, you get to copy that spell. And of course, it's just like all the other swords, it's got equipped too. So again, I don't expect all the cards to be this powerful, but... You also should expect some powerful stuff from this slot. And that's all I've got today. A little bit of a shorter episode than usual, but I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you found it useful. If you made it to the end and you're watching on YouTube, please do like, comment, and subscribe, all that good stuff. And if you do want to check it out, check out the Patreon, patreon.com slash limited level ups. If you'd like to support the show or any of my content, it's the number one place you can do that. There's also a bunch of benefits over there that we want to give back to you to help you become a better limited player. And yeah, like I said, this is just the beginning of all the great Thunder Junction content. Come back for more. Definitely going to be more as the weeks go on. Set review happening next week. Then we've got the streamer early access is also going to be on the 10th. So if you're into that, go check that out on Twitch. And yeah, thank you for watching and listening. We'll see you next time.